Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Henry Brown knew nothing but slavery for most of his life. Despite his upbringing on the Hermitage Plantation in Virginia, Henry had a surprisingly positive outlook on life. He appreciated nature and enjoyed showing the children on the plantation the flowers that grew there. He was a religious man with a whole lot of faith in a world that had done him so much wrong. Henry's faith brought him to Nancy, another slave, and the two of them got married and had three children of their own. He'd been making regular payments to his wife's master as a way of keeping him from selling her and the children off. But the master had other ideas. There was more money in selling Nancy and the kids to the highest bidder than there was in taking Henry's meager payments. So the master separated the family, leaving Henry despondent and alone. You might think something like that would break Henry's faith in people, but it didn't. In fact, he was about to take the biggest leap of faith in his life with the help of two men who had a plan. After the loss of his family, Henry knew he had to get out. He refused to go through something as heartbreaking as that again if he could help it. So he contacted a friend, a freed black man named James Smith, who helped him orchestrate his escape. James and a white shoemaker named Sam Smith came up with an ingenious way to get Henry out of Virginia and into the north where he could be free. Except Henry didn't use the Underground Railroad or abolitionist safe houses to escape. He chose a very different route. Actually, several different routes, including a trip by wagon, then by railroad, transfer to a steamboat, another wagon, a second journey by train, a ferry, and another railroad until he finally reached Philadelphia. After 27 grueling hours, Henry was free, and he used that freedom to advocate on behalf of other slaves. He spoke out as an abolitionist against the South and its barbaric practices. To avoid the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, he moved to England and became a magician to entertain crowds and earn a living. He eventually remarried and began a new family, taking them back to the U.S. with him after the end of the Civil War. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is it about Henry's story that still resonates today? Many slaves escaped their fates, but we never got to hear their stories. Well, Henry's tale is a special one. Like other slaves, he was so desperate to leave a life of pain and suffering that he embarked on a journey where, at any moment, he could either die or be discovered. But of course, his efforts were a success, and literature about how he earned his freedom found its way back south, boosting the morale among other slaves. He became a sort of celebrity, for better or for worse. You see, Henry Brown was the first slave to mail himself to freedom. He spent a little over one day in a three-foot-by-two-foot crate that was hauled from his home in Virginia to the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee in Pennsylvania. He survived with the help of a single air hole cut in the side of the box and a small portion of biscuits and water by his side. Any person might be dehydrated, exhausted, or even unconscious after such a long, difficult journey. He even spent part of that journey upside down. But Henry Box Brown never lost his positive attitude. Upon opening the crate in Philadelphia, one of the men remembered hearing Henry's very first words as a free man. True to his positive attitude, they were anything but frustrated, tired, angry, or even afraid. He simply smiled from inside the dark wooden crate, waved his hand, and cheerfully said, How do you do, gentlemen? Henry Brown, it seems, knew how to deliver a powerful message. Long before the age of social media, people kept to themselves more. Lives were lived in private, and no one had to know every little detail about what we had for lunch or what we bought at the store. Privacy was not a four-letter word. 
Nobody embodied that philosophy more than Homer and Langley. They were brothers who lived in New York City, Harlem, in fact, in a brownstone with their mother and father. Their childhood was pretty normal. They went to public school, attended Columbia University, and went on to do great things. Langley, an engineer and concert pianist, performed at Carnegie Hall, while Homer practiced maritime law. The brothers were close, best friends even. Having only each other and no spouses to speak of, they continued to live at home with their parents well into adulthood. Sadly, nothing lasts forever. Their mother and father divorced in 1909, and the boys, wanting to remain in their home with their mother, stayed in Harlem while their father moved downtown. For 20 years, the boys lived in that brownstone until two major life events changed them forever. The stock market crash of 1929 and the death of their mother, As the Great Depression ravaged the city, their neighborhood began to change as well. Their mother had left them everything, every known possession, including the brownstone. Their neighbors had not been so lucky, and as the people they knew moved away, groups of African Americans looking for a better life moved in. Harlem was beginning its shift into the jazz capital of the world, a place that would cultivate greats like John Coltrane and Charlie Parker, But Homer and Langley saw things differently. With their mother gone and their neighborhood changing into something they no longer recognized, they retreated from it. They boarded up their windows, locked their doors, disconnected their telephone, and slipped away from public life. It wasn't that they feared certain kinds of people. Homer and Langley were terrified of change in all its forms. After divorce, depression, and death, I think they had simply taken all they could manage and just sort of closed themselves off from the world, both mentally and physically. Rumors began to circulate about the brothers' unorthodox lifestyle, which brought unwanted attention to their doorsteps. Some people thought the men were hoarding vast amounts of money and treasure in their house. After a few attempted burglaries, Langley had to put his engineering knowledge to use by building a series of traps to discourage thieves from entering uninvited. The thing was, the Collier brothers were hoarding something in their Harlem brownstone. Everything. Boxes, old bicycles, guns, camera equipment, part of a horse-drawn carriage, over 25,000 books, human organs in jars, and a Ford Model T, which Langley had rigged to provide electricity to the house. The once pristine brownstone had become a maze of boxes and debris, and the men took to crawling through tunnels to get from room to room. As they grew older, however, disease took its toll and Homer was hit the hardest. He went blind and eventually succumbed to inflammatory rheumatism, which left him paralyzed. Langley took everything upon himself, becoming his brother's sole caregiver. He brought him food and water, bathed him, and kept the public away. But all that privacy came at a cost. Years later, a man who identified himself as Charles Smith called the local police, claiming there was a dead body inside the Collier home. When the police arrived, they found it impossible to get in the front door. It wasn't just that the windows were barred, or that the doors were locked. They couldn't get past the stack of boxes and old newspapers, or the furniture that had been piled up in the brownstone's entryway. It took seven men to haul enough junk out in order to give police the access they needed. Once inside, they were able to look around, and what they found astounded them. Over 120 tons of debris had been collected inside the home, but tucked away in a corner, surrounded by boxes that stretched from floor to ceiling, was a human corpse. The dead body, it turns out, was real, and it was Homer. Authorities assumed his brother had been the one to make the anonymous phone call, but Langley was nowhere to be found. There were rumors that he'd managed to skip town. Reports came in for over a week about Langley being sighted in nine different states, but none of them turned out to be true. You see, Langley, even in his old age, had refused to give up on his brother. But his fear of the outside world had left him with no options for getting Homer the help he needed. It wasn't until after more than 100 tons of clutter were removed from the brownstone when he finally resurfaced. It turns out, he'd been there the whole time. Langley had been in the process of bringing his brother some food, 
crawling through a narrow tunnel of rusty bed springs, when he triggered one of his own traps. Moments later, a massive pile of suitcases and bundled newspapers collapsed on top of him. Like I said before, Langley Collier had taken everything upon himself. Literally. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Stay curious.